The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. Let's turn, if you would please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want to read our text again, which is familiar to you. This is Paul's brief introduction to the final days of earth's history when God will judge the world in his wrath. And God's wrath is indicated in the first three verses of this chapter before Paul begins to exhort Christians about how they should live knowing this vital information. And that comes up in the next part that we'll study a little bit later on. But for now, Paul is talking about God's wrath and the judgment that is coming. Now, notice in verse number two, he said, for yourselves know perfectly. In other words, he's going to tell them something that they are familiar with. And because they are familiar with it, he doesn't give a lot of detail in this passage. So he says in verse 1, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. A few weeks ago, Brother Radford Wong, our missionary to China, was visiting with us. And uh, before I I tell you this, I I would like to relate to you that Brother Wong sent me a message last night uh, telling us about his his grandmother that's about to die, and he's going to return to China very soon, and he asked us to pray for the family. So we want to remember Brother Wong and his family. But he visited with us uh, a few weeks ago, and he described the Chinese government's mounting hostility against Christianity. Now, by God's grace, there are many in China who've come to faith in Christ, and that's caused uh, the government to crack down on churches and to arrest pastors and even shutter the doors of some churches. And they do this because the government there is afraid of Western influence that may come through Christianity, and they consider that to be subversive to their form of government. And indeed, I I think that we would have to say that the Bible is against communism and against socialism as a government system. Socialism and communism want to be the conscience of the people and the God of the people and They're not really willing that anybody but the government should have control of the minds of their subjects. It seems fantastic, but one of the things that Brother Wong told us was that the Chinese government is planning to retranslate the Bible to make it to conform with socialistic, communistic themes. Now, that that seems shocking, but it really shouldn't be all that shocking to us because this is something that goes on across the world in other places, even non-communist countries, where the Bible has been translated with humanistic influence. And so the Bible is interpreted and it's molded to conform with human thinking, and that is nothing less than a violation of God's first commandment, which says, Ye shall have no other gods before me. So man is elevated, God above God, which attempts to make us sovereign, not God, and that is the ultimate form of idolatry. A few weeks ago, I was reading in the papers about the German courts that said that parents don't have the right to homeschool their children, that they must accept government education or else risk having their children removed from their homes. Now, of course, Many, or even most parents, homeschool for this very purpose. They don't want the government to have control of their children's minds. And so to prohibit homeschooling is an attack on Christianity because that says that government is God. They want to shape the child's mind according to humanistic ideologies. And China is practicing that in another way. They've determined that they will allow adults to have some freedoms to worship, but now they're saying they will not allow children to attend church services. Now, the point is that we're seeing governments, all forms of government, converging to destroy Christianity. Socialism is the enemy of Christ. It's not coincidental that in every socialistic country, Christianity has suffered. You, you have probably seen the, 
the news stories about the newly elected congresswoman from New York who is unashamedly a socialist. And many say that, well, she is the new face of the Democratic Party and she will push them further to the left until socialism is a part of America's fabric. And this is the latest fad of the blue coast of America, socialism. And the result of that will be restrictions on our freedoms, especially the freedom to worship God according to conscience. The government wants to be our God. And that doesn't work in a democratic system. And thus, you have the push towards socialism. And so with China and Germany and Sweden and the United Kingdom, and now we even know Canada as well, the rights of parents and the rights of preachers, the rights of those who disagree are being forced under the total subservience of the state. Now, if I were to ask you, what does that look like? You, you as a Christian, what does that look like? I think most of you would say, well, that looks very much like the great and terrible day of the Lord. That it looks very much like end times and it looks very much antichrist. It's the world against the church, it's the world against godliness, and it's the world in favor of the God of this world who is Satan. But I would say that those are not indicators that enable us to put a date on the day of God's wrath. Only God knows that time. The times and the seasons are not discernible to us because we live on this side of the rapture. And the times and seasons that Paul speaks of are things that are on the other side of the rapture. And so we're not looking for the Antichrist today. We're not looking for those kinds of signs. We are looking for Jesus the Christ. That's who we need to focus on. Now I believe though that God does allow all these things that happen as a reminder that the day is coming. We're forced through these to search the scriptures, to research them about the second coming of Christ. And so God uses these times to sharpen us and to keep us looking and longing for that day that Christ will return. Now, persecution has always been the devil's tactic. Ignorantly to Satan, though, the devil is in God's predetermined plan. And persecution has never worked for Satan, at least not in the way that he hoped that it would. Persecution has never shut down the church. All that it's done is to make the church stronger. And so the church grows through its oppression. God uses that to cause us to depend upon him. He increases our faith through suffering. He increases the resolve to serve him. So the more that we suffer, the more dependent we are on him. And we need to learn that, that God works that way and that God's ways are above our ways. It seems like that shouldn't work in our favor, but in fact, the Word of God says that it does. So it is through suffering that we come into a richer, more rewarding experience in the glories of heaven. And so history does prove this to be true. Even recent history has proved the resilience of Christianity. Persecution hasn't stopped it. The communism of the old Soviet Union persecuted the church, but with glasnost, it was discovered that the church was thriving underground and that communism was unable to stamp it out. In China, the same is true. The government suppressed Christianity, but the current crackdown is only because the, the, the unregistered churches in China have mushroomed to the point that the numbers of Christians that are in China are perceived to be a threat to the billions of them who aren't. And when I say threat, I, I, I mean a threat of conversion to make more Christians who are free in Jesus Christ. And I remind you that Christianity is not a threat to overthrow governments by force, but it threatens because it changes ideology, it changes thinking, it changes purpose in life, it wrests control from dictators through, through kindness and benevolence and fairness and genuine concern for all rather than just a few. Christianity is a global enterprise and that's because the owner or the founder of Christianity owns it all. He owns the globe. This world is his and the fullness thereof. It's all his and he shall reign forever. Make no mistake about this. He shall reign forever. When God works in God's time. Now our study is the great and terrible day of the Lord. His day is the method by which he will wrench the world systems out from under the control of the God of this world. Satan is a usurper of God's authority. 
And God will take this world back and he will restore it to the righteousness of its original condition. And since people are willing participants in Satan's schemes, they will suffer the gruesome judgments that are used to take the world back. Now, I'd like to resume the discussion we began last week. We, we've expanded to say more than Paul says in this text. Paul said, I have no need to write unto you about the times and the seasons. And that was because Paul had already taught them these things. He already taught these things when he first organized the church at Thessalonica. And that's indicated in chapter 1 when he said, those who believe in Christ will be delivered from the wrath to come. And I think it's obvious then that he must have explained the wrath to come out of all the multiple Old Testament texts that he could use to elaborate on this awful day. He had only the Old Testament to preach, and certainly he would have took them there because it's such a prominent part of Old Testament prophecy. And so when Paul said, I have no need to write this, it's because they already knew. But that doesn't help us, who might not know as much as they knew. We didn't have the Apostle Paul to explain all of it as he did to them. And so we look at it, now to, to learn more about what is he talking about in this passage? What, what, is, what is meant by times and seasons? And what is, what is the wrath to come? What is the destruction? What does he mean in verse number three by the travail that comes upon a woman with child? And so our quest is to uncover that meaning. And if you've not been with us in this study, uh, you can get more information by listening to the first three parts of this message. But most of you have been here. So we're going to pick up the study in, in our outline at point number four. Point number four is the calamity of the day. Our research in scripture has taken us to Jesus' discussion with his disciples in Matthew chapter 24. And this is the discourse that he gave in the last week before his crucifixion concerning this coming kingdom of God. And the disciples were very interested in the kingdom. They were always asking questions. And so Jesus explained how God will bring his kingdom to the earth. Now, if you look at this text in chapter 24, we're going to read verses 3 through 14. It's a long reading, but it never hurts us to read the word of God. The church needs more of that. And I'm sure that none of you here today has overreached in your reading of God's word. And so we're going to read here and Jesus explains what happens. And this is really just a small part of the entire discourse. Matthew 24, verse number three. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? So that what everybody wants to know. When is it going to be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and, and earthquakes in divers places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, we've discussed four calamities of the end times, in the, and in the last message, we just started the fifth. But let me list these for you again. These are the increasing birth pangs, the sorrows that Jesus speaks of, and these are those things that usher in God's earthly kingdom. Like a woman that's ready to deliver her child, these things worsen as the day goes on. Now, first, we learn that there is religious deception. In verses 4 and 5, Jesus said that many would come in his name, but they'll come offering salvation from the perilous times of tribulation, and they will deceive many. There is worldwide deception because God's wrath is worldwide. And where there's wrath, there are those that claim they can save from wrath. And so that brings us to the second, and that is false saviors. 
There's so much chaos that people will look for answers. People are naturally religious, and so religion is a place to turn for comfort. And there will be plenty that will offer help, but there is no hope without the true Christ. Thirdly, is global conflict. In verse 7, nation will rise against nation. In verse 6, there are wars and rumors of wars. There is war, and where there isn't war, there's fear of war. Some of you older folks may remember the Cuban Missile Crisis of the early 1960s. I was just a child then, but I remember that. And this is when Fidel Castro parked nuclear warheads 90 miles off the coast of Florida in Cuba. And there was panic here. The, 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 our, our country was set on edge because one hot-headed dictator could, utter, could, could, could unleash destruction. And the threat was the devastation like happened in World War II when the U.S. dropped the atomic bombs on Japan. And so the tensions were, were heightened. People were afraid. They were aware that, that this conflict had caused great devastation. And until that was resolved, there was still that fear. And in the last days, there will be that kind of fear, fear of violent death, and there is panic. Fourthly, is global hunger and disasters. Verse 7 again, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Now last time I took you to Revelation 8 to see how global starvation can happen. Earthquakes and explosive volcanoes, fire raining from the sky and burning lava flying, uh, falling upon fields and forests that will result in the destruction of crops. Wheat, barley, corn, oats, beans, one-third of all crops are destroyed. The scripture says that trees will be burned up. Salvation won't be an African problem, or rather starvation won't be an African problem. It won't be a, an Indian problem. It's not a Bangladesh problem. It's a global problem. Earthquakes are worldwide, eruptions of volcanoes, ash billowing hundreds of miles into the air and caught up by the jet stream will blot out the sun and the moon shining through it will look like blood, according to the scriptures. And then the Lord mentions the fifth birth pang, and this is the place where we left off, and that is persecuted believers. Now today, that's what we started with, China, Russia, countries of the world where there's persecution. Jesus said in verse number 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Persecution of the church today, and the persecution in past centuries, pales in comparison to the hatred of all things Christian in its coming calamity. Now in this text, the subject is primarily Jewish believers. Jesus' intent is to restore the kingdom to Israel. And for that to happen, there must be thousands and perhaps even millions of Jews that will be saved. And Satan's interest is to stop the kingdom. His last great hope of survival is to prevent the Lord from taking control of his empire. Now, interestingly, Satan tried to do that before the crucifixion. Remember how Satan tempted Jesus and he tried to rid the world of Jesus' influence of Christianity by subtly tempting him. And so he took him up on a high mountain and he took him up on the pinnacle of the temple and stretched out before him all the world, all the kingdoms of the world. And he tempted the human Jesus and offered him all the kingdoms. And he could have all of that without the cross if only Jesus would worship him. But if Jesus had accepted that offer, he wouldn't have ruled. He would have sinned, and that would leave the world under Satan's control. That was a deceptive trick, and Jesus refused. We're talking here about the Son of God. This is not the Son of Adam. So his refusal set the surety of a coming, a coming conflict deeper in stone that one day there is going to be a worldwide, earth-shattering, bloody war, a conflict between Christ and Satan, and control will be wrested from him, and Satan will be destroyed. But in the meantime, Satan starts an all-out campaign for the destruction of Jewish believers. He'll try to stop the kingdom any way that he can, and I don't have time in this message to give you all the details of that, but when Satan is cast out of the heavens, then he'll turn all of his attention to the destruction of Israel. 
Now, if you'll turn for a moment to Revelation chapter 12, we'll read here a description of his campaign against Israel. At first, Satan's emissary, the Antichrist, will establish a false peace treaty with Israel. He'll guarantee their safety, but that's a ruse. It's only a way to gain confidence with hopes of their later destruction. Now, here in Revelation chapter 12, John, in his vision of the end times, says, And when the dragon... That is Satan. When Satan saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. The woman here is Israel, who brought forth the man-child. The man-child is Christ. Now remember that as we read, the dragon is Satan, the, the woman is Israel, the child is Christ. And to the woman, Israel, were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent, there we have the devil again, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what is Israel doing at this time? What causes Satan to do this? Well, there are 12,000 Jews that are raised up as witnesses out of all the 12 tribes. So there are 144,000 special witnesses that speak the gospel to people everywhere that they go. And because of their witness, many Jewish people will be saved. And because they have a job to do, a mission from God, God will protect them. Because Satan will kill them, God will protect them until that mission is done. Now, th these verses tell us they'll be protected until the mission is done. Many believe what they'll do is flee to the rock city of Petra in Jordan. Seems like no place would be safe from the overwhelming forces of the Antichrist. But in some way, perhaps with the power of angels, God protects Israel. Eventually... Many will come to the faith, and then, when that's done, they will be killed by the Antichrist. We read of these believers in Revelation 6, verse 9 through 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they crowd, cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now there that scripture is telling us there are those that are died, have died. They're, they've heard the message, they believed, and then they were killed. And now they're just waiting for all the rest of the ones that will be killed. And then God will have his vengeance. God will be righteous, and his righteous wrath will avenge them. The kingdom is coming, the king is coming, and he will bring righteous justice to this world. Well, now we return to Matthew 24, where Jesus tells us of another birth pang. The next one is rank apostasy. Verse number 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Some believers won't hold out. With physical persecution and weak faith, they give up. Now, I think probably, almost assuredly, I would say, many of them were never true believers. They profess Christ, but there isn't a real change in their hearts. They are people that are outwardly reformed, but they haven't been inwardly regenerated. And so when they're persecuted, that shows the true attitude of the heart. Persecution will bring out, are you a true believer in Christ? Now, I think that many of us should strongly consider this. We should strongly think about this because there are people that fall out of church and they make up every excuse for not coming to church. And when they do, we ought to suspect their profession. And if they don't come back, they should be treated according to the word of God. They should be treated as unbelievers. These are people that rely on things they did in the past. They confessed. They were baptized. They worked in the church for a while. They were Sunday school teachers or whatever. They were once active in the church, but they aren't any longer. And the question must be, why aren't they any longer? Now, if you look at verse number 13, 
in this text. Jesus said, those that endure to the end shall be saved. You know what that is? That is a verse about preservation and perseverance. People that are saved endure to the end. They never give up their faith. So are we to conclude that dropouts are saved? Well, for sure they're not endure persecution. If they don't do the lesser in these days, how would we think they would do the greater in those days? True believers must persevere. They stay faithful. Now, the tribulation then will bear out many false converts. Those are the toughest of times. And those who don't hold out in these lesser times are far from certain to be true believers. There is no ground of assurance for the person who, who with flimsy excuses, turns his nose up at the church. Now, in the tribulation, false professors will give up the hiding places of true believers. The police forces of the Antichrist will threaten them with their lives, and they'll give up information, and believers will be found out and killed. In Matthew 13, Jesus said, family members will turn against each other. Think not, he says, that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Does that make us think that anybody who buys into this me-first society will protect anybody when their own lives are at stake? Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Now, people with a form of godliness are those who are Christians when the times are good, but they care nothing for it when the times are bad. They love self, not God. Every time that you hear a sermon about how awesome you are, how valuable you are, chalk that up to Satan. If you hear things like, you can have whatever you want by naming it and claiming it, mark that down as devil speak. Those are lovers of self. Oh, there'll be plenty of those in the last days. What happens to their godliness when they're attacked? Well, they take off their religion like taking off a coat. They just easily lay it aside. Rank apostasy, Jesus says. Those left behind when Christ comes, those that are still filling the churches the Sunday afterwards, these are people that will switch their allegiance to the Antichrist. Well, with all of these horrible events that are described in the great and terrible day, Jesus makes the next astounding statement. Truly an astounding statement. In verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Now perhaps you might think, well, that's not a calamity. But I want to list it here and I'll show you why. So seventhly, G on your listening sheet, is universal evangelism. Evangelism is a wonderful thing, isn't it? I've talked about that as I began the message today. People need to hear the gospel of Christ. People need to be saved. And only the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel that delivers from the wrath to come. It delivers from condemnation. The gospel has that power. But did you also know that the gospel has the power to condemn? And it condemns so deeply that no one can recover from it? And you say, well, how is that? Well, it condemns by its rejection. Rejecting the gospel increases condemnation. It brings greater condemnation to those who hear it and reject it than to those who are condemned without it. Now, people who never hear the gospel are not condemned for not believing the gospel. Now, hear me out for a minute because I'm not saying that we shouldn't preach the gospel because the gospel condemns them. No, they're condemned already. That's what the scripture says. But because they don't respond to the light that they have, they are condemned. They've rejected, they've rejected the God of creation and they've made images to worship. So the person or the people who, who never hears the gospel is not going to have the charge of rejecting the gospel lodged against him because they never heard. 
They'll die without Christ. They'll suffer judgment of all their other sins, but not this, because that's not a sin they committed. Well, there's some who complain, you know, it's not fair. It's just not fair. It's not fair if people don't hear the gospel. All people hear it because everybody must be given a chance to be saved. And these complainers need some very good lessons on the sovereignty of God in salvation because God owes salvation to no one. We are the offenders. And there isn't anybody who's saved by chance. Salvation is a deliberate act of God. And it happens only by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is the purpose of the gospel preached to all nations in that time? And how does it happen? How can that happen when the witnesses of Christ are martyred with no freedom to preach in those days? How is the world going to hear about Christ? Well, let's tackle the first question. Why is there worldwide preaching of the gospel when there won't be worldwide reception of the gospel? And I would say, well, it's no different than the reason that we preach the gospel today. God doesn't identify the elect except by belief. Among all the nations of the world, there are some that God has chosen to be saved and they won't be saved without the gospel. So God makes sure the gospel reaches them. Some years ago, I, I read a pamphlet by a preacher who didn't believe in God's election. And he made this statement, I quote, even if a person gets saved by simply reading the Bible, a host of humans were involved in the centuries long process of writing translating, preserving, protecting, printing, distributing, and financing required to propagate Gospels in general, that that one Bible in particular should find its way into the hands of that one specific person. Now, I read that man's statement in amazement. He didn't believe in election, and yet he, he didn't know that he articulated that doctrine and defended it as well as anybody who believes it. It was through the ignorance, through his ignorance, that the Holy Spirit spoke truth like he did through Balaam's donkey. The gospel will be preached across the world to those in unbelief so that the particular ones for whom it was intended will hear and believe. Peter wrote that God is unwilling that any of those who have been chosen by God should perish, that he is long-suffering and he doesn't end the world until they believe. And that's truly remarkable, considering in 2 Thessalonians, Paul wrote that God will send strong delusion so people will believe a lie. Only the elect will not believe the lie. Now, we need to recognize that the day of the Lord is so terrible that the most of the world, the greatest numbers of people in the world are sealed in their doom because they gladly and enthusiastically follow the end to Christ. So they are removed from the grace of God. Why should you believe now? Why should you settle this now? Because you'll not later. Hear the gospel and reject it? Do you think that God will be gracious enough to you that you will hear and believe later? Why shouldn't God allow you to be deluded if you don't believe it now? Well, our next question is, how is the gospel going to be preached across the entire world when in thousands of years that's never been done? Well, the answer comes in an unexpected way, and it's done in a way never done before. Turn to Revelation chapter 14. And as we turn there, I want to caution you not to count on this method of evangelism today because it's not going to happen. This is for the end, for the great and terrible day of the Lord. And when this happens, Jesus says the world, the end will come. The end of this world will come. Revelation 14 verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, this is the way that every person in every corner of the world, in every jungle, in every desert, in every city, in every cave, in every waste place from Arctic snows to desert sands and heat, every socialite, every hermit, everyone will hear. An angel flies in the skies with the everlasting gospel. Notice the reach. Every nation, kindred, and tongue, all people will hear. 
Now, how that happens, I don't know. But simultaneously across the world, the heavens will open. The glory of God will shine. And an angel with the everlasting gospel will preach to those who live on this earth. I suppose the voice of the angel is heard in the ear by the language that each person speaks. And what does it say that he preaches? He preaches the everlasting gospel. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What is that gospel that he preached? What will he preach? Is it different from what we preach? Oh, I think that it has much in common with the gospel we preach. It must be a gospel of grace. That's the only way that God saves. It must be about the forgiveness of sins through the cross of Christ because that's the only way that he forgives sins. It must be about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because that is the gospel. It's a gospel of faith. It's a gospel of grace. Because surely no one in that day will be audacious enough to say, I will be saved because I've been so good. Oh, it's a common gospel. It's in common with what we preach today with one notable exception. It is the final gospel. The angel adds this information to it. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. I can preach everything this angel preaches but this. I don't know when the hour of God's judgment will come. I can tell you or can't tell you that the great and terrible day of the Lord is here. I can warn you about it. I can plead with you to come to Christ now. I can tell you to come now because that day can catch you unawares if you're found without faith in him. I can do all of that, but I can't tell you this. The hour of judgment is come. So the angel knows something I don't know. Oh, he probably knows many things I don't know. Jesus said, the gospel will be preached in all the world. And then he says, then the end will come. And that's what the angel says. The end is here. Fear God because this is final. Trust Christ because there is no tomorrow. Now the elect will hear the message. Then the last elect person on the earth will be saved. Out of the multitudes and the nations of tongues and people, the elect will hear and believe. And then what does the Bible say? God will gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. If you still have Matthew 24 open, hear verse number 31. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The gospel of Christ, that's the only way that you'll be saved. The Chinese, the, the Germans, the British, the Canadian government, the United States Supreme Court, the Congress, all may hate the gospel, and they do, but they can't do anything to prevent it. It shall stand. It's the word of God. And all the forces of hell can't do this. They can't stop you from believing in Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit works, when the Spirit works, all opposition to God is canceled. If you're not saved, then you need to ask God for understanding. Ask him to send his spirit and awaken you and enlighten you. And if you believe, it is because the power of God in you. How will you know that God's chosen you to salvation? Very simple. Repent and believe. You'll be saved. Trust Christ. Come to him. Believe in him. You'll be saved. Then you'll know, well, God chose me because that's how you're saved. Now, you've heard the gospel. And I can only ask, is your condemnation greater because you reject it? Or are you saved by it? Where you spend eternity depends on that answer. What do you do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's a very simple answer. Believe it. Repent of your sins and believe it. And be saved from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Brian Baptist Church 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.